Edeling from uh, CWI in Amsterdam. And uh, he's going to be talking to us today about uh, very large parameter problems. Um, so, Walter, if you're there, I will uh, yes. pass over to you. You can see my screen and hear me, I suppose. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, let me just make this large. Yes. Okay, so thank you again for having me. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, again, a forward UQ uh, problem. So we're not, uh, not calibrating, we're just propagating uh, uncertainty forward through the model. And if you, if you were present at Tuesday's talk, I was talking about uh, stochastic allocation and an uh, adaptive version of it. And I've mentioned this before, but just a short recap, that if you do these kinds of methods, uh, you're relying on one-dimensional quadrature nodes, which are extended to higher dimensions via tensor products. But then it's this tensor product that can become potentially very uh, expensive in number of simulations. And if you do an adaptive version of that, you are uh, making your sampling plan in an iterative fashion. Right? You're starting with a, a single sample and you're building it up in directions which, uh, which turn out to be important. Right? And that way you get an anisotropic sampling plan uh, that refines the important inputs. Uh, it's still based on tensor products though, right? so you don't, you don't get around that. It's still a tensor product based approach. And yeah, if you then visualize the refinement, you get similar plot like this, right? Iteration number and uh, inputs on the vertical and the colors denotes which uh, combination of inputs got refined at what time. Now this has a potential downside and that is uh, I'm saying potential, it doesn't have to be a downside, but you, you have this big problem and you, you're breaking it up in small pieces. Uh, but with this method, you're breaking it up in a lot of small pieces. Uh, I'm just showing you 70 iterations. I think for the COVID sim work, we needed like 130 or something. And if you look at the number of new samples that you compute at each iteration, it, it's rather low. But sometimes you might get 40 or something, but on average it's, uh, it's around 10 new evaluations. And this, well, if, if your code is very, very expensive, then this might not be a, a downside because you're still utilizing a large part of your machine in that way. Uh, but let's say if you, if you do get like a large allocation on the supercomputer and maybe you get it for a short amount of time, then this might not be the right way to go. Right, and also in the case of COVID sim, um, it's, it's an HPC application, but as I mentioned before, it's not a massive one. Right, and I'm chopping it up in even smaller pieces here. So it might be nicer to just you know, take a single ensemble and just fill up the machine and run that. Right, and another potential downside is if I have 100 iterations, I might run into queue times. Right? If, if the the machine is very busy, there might be a long queue time. So you would have to wait a bit before every iteration or before every uh, ensemble actually gets submitted. Now, uh, I'm gonna talk today about something called active soft spaces, which doesn't have this problem. And if you look at uh, stochastic collocation, again, uh, your coordinate axis will be aligned with your uh, input axis. Right? And I'm here, I'm calling the input X. And in fact, you're your, right? your input axis or your coordinate axis. But it is quite likely that if you're to able to, to visualize the variation of your function, for instance, by contour lines in this two dimensional example, the direction along which this function will vary the most, it's probably not going to be aligned with x1 and x2. Right? It might be something else. And in fact, in this example, uh, if you look at this line over here, it contains all variation and right, the uh, function is constant along this direction. And so the, the general idea of the active soft space method is, is trying to find these directions. Right? You're rotating your coordinate system and then you're dropping the directions along which the function doesn't vary much. And in this way you hope to get a, a lower dimensional coordinate system along which your function will vary the most on average. Now, in order to do that, you're, you want to find the active variables, which are called wire. 
And by the way, if you want to read about active source spaces, where it was developed by Paul Constantine back in 2014. And the, the goal here is basically to find uh, this matrix U1 here. That right? is dimension D times, uh, or capital D times small d, where capital D is the number of inputs, and small d is hopefully a lot less, right, in the number of active variables. And so it's a linear projection. And if you're able to find that, then the next step would be to make like a circuit model of your code. I'm calling it G here, but then in the reduced input domain. And so those are the two things. And then of course the questions are, you know, what is U1 and what is going to be G? Now for the first one, uh, finding uh, U1, again, remember we want to find directions of large variability. And so it might be a, a good idea to involve the, the gradient of the code somehow. And what active source spaces do is they they construct this matrix here, the C matrix. Right? It is like, uh, I would say like an uncentered covariance matrix. Right? There's no mean, but there's still a covariance structure that involves your, your, your code gradient. Right? And it is weighted by P of X, where uh, this is the input distribution of your inputs. Again, something we uh, we have to assume, but if we have an assumption on the uh, input distributions, you could compute this weighted matrix. If you don't have a lot of inputs, you could maybe do some quadrature rule. If you have a lot of inputs, you could maybe compute this with Monte Carlo. But in any case, you can see that because of this transpose here, it's a symmetric matrix. So we'll have a, uh, an eigenvalue decomposition in which the eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other or they have orthogonal columns, I would say. And then you can look at the, uh, the, the decay of eigenvalues. So you rank your eigenvalues from largest to uh, the smallest. And what I'm doing here is I'm pooling all the large ones in lambda one and all the small ones in lambda two. And you're hoping, of course, that there's a big gap between lambda one and lambda two. And if you do that, it's kind of like a, like a PCA, except uh, in the using the, the gradients of the output. And so if lambda one contains my small d large eigenvalues, then u1 are the eigenvectors that point in the direction of uh, greatest variability, right, on average, because I'm, I'm averaging over the input distribution. So, with this, you have your, your defined your active source space. Right? Again, this linear projection. And now we know that U1 are the uh, dominant eigenvectors of this C matrix. And in the, say, in the same vein, you could define inactive variables, right? It's just the U2 transpose times X. And then the last thing you have to do here is make a circuit uh, in the reduced space. And th this could in principle be, uh, be anything, although typically I think uh, a circuit that regresses would be better than an interpolation based circuit. So maybe uh, you could do Kerrigan or you could fit the Gaussian process or something like that. Now the issue here with C, uh, it depends of course on the gradients. So you need to be able to compute that. And this is not always easy. If you can do it though, I think it's a very good method to use and probably better than, than the method that I'm going to describe. Um, but you know, if you have a lot of inputs, maybe this is not feasible or maybe there's some weird uh, bifurcation behavior or there might be all kinds of problems why it might be hard to compute your gradients. And so there are alternatives that, that use like active subspace-ish ideas, uh, but without having uh, gradient information. One of them is based on Gaussian processes that's done by Serge Guyas and, uh, and his students. And the other one is based on neural networks. And they were introduced by, uh, by Tripathi and Billy Onis, I think from Penn State in the US. And uh, that's the one I will focus at. Uh, it is, of course, in a sense similar to the, the let's say the classical active subspace in the sense that i'm still looking for active variables which are a linear projection of the inputs 
a scale of a vector, not the same one now. So that's why I've called this one W instead of U. Uh, it has the same dimension as U1 and like U1, the, the columns are still uh, orthogonal or orthonormal even. And I'm still looking to make a circuit model in the, in the Y space. Now it, it is different because uh, W1 is no longer uh, it's no longer the set of D dominant eigenvectors. Right? It, uh, in this case, it is uh, it's parameterized uh, by gram schmidt for instance. So I'm guessing most, if not all, of you are familiar. But you know, let's say you have a set of vectors Q. They're they're independent, but they're not orthogonal to each other. And then you can apply gram schmidt in order to get these Ws, uh, which are orthogonal. And in these Qs, they are the, the columns of this Q matrix. And my orthogonalized uh, vectors W will be my uh, the columns of my W1 matrix. And this then becomes uh, the, the weight matrix of a, uh, in my case, a simple feed forward neural network, but with linear activation. And if you do linear activation, you will just get the same uh, active soft space projection back. Uh, if you see the, there's a middle expression over here, that's the standard representation of a hidden layer of a neural network. Right, you have the output of the previous layer, which in my case is the input layer. So there's X, you pre-multiply with your neural network weights and then you apply some activation. Right, and if it's linear, I just get the active uh, subspace back. And this means that you can plug this in as the, the first hidden layer of a neural network. Right, if this is my input layer, uh, this is my, uh, my reduced input sp uh, space, Y. And then the columns of W1 are the, uh, the weights on these uh, lines connecting the inputs to each neuron in the first layer. Now, I'm using a couple standard things here uh, to uh, train it and using the square loss to minimize the, the code outputs F. So again, not the gradients of F, but I'm using only the code outputs and the, the surrogate prediction. Uh, this is a standard neural network update step that you minimize your weights based on the, the gradients of the loss. However, here in the in second layer, which I'm calling the deep active software layer, it's different, right? Because W1 is not random, right? it's parameterized, it has to be uh, orthonormal. So I have to optimize with respect to Q first. And so this will be my update step where alpha is the learning rate that you can estimate somehow. It's not really important here. But then if I look at the, this gradient here, uh, right, L is a scalar, Q is just a matrix, so this becomes a matrix. If I look at a single entry of the matrix, I get this expression, uh, this one. And you know, partial L, partial W1, that's just the output of standard backpropagation, like right, the gradient of the loss. Uh, but I also need this guy here. And right, so you can see that what I need to compute extra compared to a standard neural network are the, uh, the derivatives of the gram schmidt vectors. Right, uh, this is not exactly the same, but if I have this, uh, uh, this partial derivative of W1 with respect to Qj, I can compute these terms here. Right, I just, it's just a matter of reshuffling some columns. So what I need to do is, is compute this, this, uh, this matrix, this, uh, this derivative of uh, the orthogonalized vectors with respect to the original non-orthogonal vectors. Uh, but because each vector W is a function of all Q vectors up to uh, I, so WI is a function of Q1 to QI, this becomes a pretty complicated expression. Like you could plug this into Maple or some other computer algebra system and just compute it brute force and you'll see that you get a massive expression. And so this is why the original authors of this, the first article, they used the automatic differentiation. Uh, but we did something different and we used a matrix calculus. So even if it's the brute force, Expansion of this, this gradient is very complicated. You can find an, a recurrent relationship that is pretty simple and pretty easy to implement. So you can exactly compute this analytically. And this is what we used. Now, I don't know which one of the two is better yet. It's, it's still work in progress. 
I kind of like the analytical expression because it, you get a bit more insight, I think. And it might be useful outside the uh, context of active source spaces. And so that's why I, I've placed it in a, in a separate GitHub repository. But anyway. We've got about two minutes left. All right, I'll speed up. Um, so once you've got that in place, then this bit is done. And then the surrogate is just a feed forward network, right? The, the network after the first layer. Right, and for this, I don't need adaptive sampling. Right, I, I just need the training database, which I can generate with Monte Carlo. Now, I will apply this to the to an HIV model, which is the same one that I showed in the uh, tutorial yesterday. So I won't go into it in detail. Uh, seven ODEs coupled, uh, 27 inputs. I'm assuming uniform distributions, which I first normalized to lie between minus one and one. And then I train my network on that. And the nice thing about this model is that I have an, a reference solution. Like this model, this model has been the classical active subspace, the one with, with derivatives has already been applied here, so I can compare. And so this is the eigenvalue comparison between two. This is the reference case. Uh, this is what I get from the network. And I, I don't have to compute this, but, uh, right, but once I train my network, I can compute the gradient if I want to in a post-processing step, so I can compare the eigenvalues. And you can see that in the case of the neural network, uh, in this case, I've selected D is equal to one. Then all the other eigenvalues are exactly zero. But if you look at the reference case, you can see that for uh, D is equal to one, you get an eigenvalue of, of roughly uh, five or between five and 10. And the next one is two orders of magnitude lower. So this is an indication that you do have an active source space. And I'll skip this. Uh, now maybe I'll talk about uh, this briefly still. Um, so this is the heat map of this, uh, this matrix for the reference case, the deep as a sock space, but also for a standard neural network, right? I don't have to apply this dimension reduction. I could do the same thing for a standard neural network. But then you can ask yourself, so what's the point of having this active subspace layer to begin with? And to do that, I've compared the performance of a standard neural network versus a deep active subspace neural network using standard training test split, right? So you take your training data, but you use only part of it to train it and you test your performance on the, uh, on the remaining data. Right? And you can see the performance for the uh, neural network, which is in blue. It does better on the training data, but then when it's time to test it, it, it you know, it's overfitted. So you get a jump in error. And in the case of deep active subspace, uh, the error, uh, the performance is very consistent between test training and test sets. And the error bars that you see here are uh, constructed from uh, replica neural networks. So I, I didn't, didn't train a single neural network because these have some stochastic components in them. So I did it 100 times to compute these uh, confidence intervals. I will skip that. And this is the visualization of the active subspace. So blue is the code which is 27 dimensional, but I just plot it along this one dimension. And then the orange line is the 1D uh, surrogate approximation. So you can see that you know, e even though you have 27 inputs, if you're able to find these directions, it, it's really just one dimensional at a given time. At a later time, it's still pretty much one dimensional, although there is a little bit of variation over here. And you can do the same with, with COVID sim. So that was the HIV model. This time we applied it to COVID sim with 51 inputs. Again, same procedure, standard Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, submitted the jobs to the Eagle supercomputer. And look for the decay and eigenvalues. And this time I had to choose two. So there's a roughly a two-dimensional active subspace. And I can again compare the, uh, the response surface in this two-dimensional space. So this is my two-dimensional surrogate. Uh, that's the actual data, the 51 dimensional data plotted on this two dimensional space. And you can see it, it matches up pretty well, you know, despite having some, uh, some noise in the uh, data here. And with that, I'll just leave the conclusions up. And this is now preprint, so it's on a review. And if you want to reproduce the results, all the code and all the data is uh, available here. So thank you.
much, Walter. Um, so we're into the break period now, so, it, so maybe if there's just a quick question, if anyone has a quick question on the floor, or are there any questions? Quick questions. Um, in which case we might, because we're running a bit over time, so we might just, um, uh, we can always come back to any further questions people have in the discussion session. So thank you very much.